in Orlando on a stage like this where I stood up and I said, this industry has a problem, big problem. We are telling everybody that we're building these awesome SaaS business models that get more and more profitable as we get more customers, and it's not true. We are building SaaS business models that have lower gross margins than the old software business models, have a higher cost of sales, lower profitability, generate less cash flow. And investors aren't okay with that anymore. And what has been our reaction? We had to take out costs, so what did we do? We took out headcount. And I updated this slide from last May. We have taken out, in less than two years, almost a million jobs out of tech. That is three times what we took out during the dot-com bust. And I lived through that, and I thought that was Armageddon. All right? So last May, the research team published a paper. And we said, look, we have proven plays that will improve the profitability of a SaaS business model. Here it is. And then we made an offer. And we said, the executive director of TSIA, who I hear is super smart and super humble, <laughs> will meet with any executive team on this topic of profitable SaaS. And since then, I have met with almost 60 executive teams from all types of companies on this topic. I want to update you on the insights that we've learned. But first, I got to tell you a story about a hike. So this summer, my wife and I go to Bar Harbor, Maine on vacation. We heard it was beautiful. It is beautiful. We stayed at this uh, hotel right along the water. And every morning, we'd have breakfast at the hotel. And we had the same server. Her name was Emily. She was from Ireland, working there for the summer. And about the third day, I'm talking to Emily, and I said, Emily, I, I want to take a hike at Acadia National Park tomorrow. And she said, are you going to hike Beehive? And I said, I, I don't know. I know I want to do Cadillac Mountain, but that's like the highest point in the park. It'd be nice to have a warm-up. And she says, well, Beehive is lovely. So the next morning, crack of dawn, I'm at the trailhead of Beehive by myself because my wife understands the concept of vacation. And I bring up this map on my phone, and this is an application called All Trails. People know All Trails if you're a hiker? Yeah, all these hands go up. There's claps, there you go. So um, All Trails is awesome, right? It tells you, shows you the path, but most importantly, it crowdsources insights on the trail. And so I'm going through the comments, and it says, hey, when you hit this fork in, in, the, in the trail, go right because it's kind of steep, and it's easier to go up the steep part. And I'm like, okay, that makes sense, but I'm also thinking, how steep can it be? This is gonna be a lovely hike, right? So I take off, I hit the fork in the road, I go right, and eventually I bump into this. <laughs> and I'm like, well, okay, so I climb up the ladder, and I'm like, yeah, that's definitely easier to go up than down. And I hike a little bit more, and I hit another one of those. And then I hike a little more, and I hit this. It's like straight up. I love to hike. Heights, not so much. But at this point, I'm committed. There's people behind me on the trail. There's no place to go but up. So I am like Spider-Manning my way up this, you know, like, oh, you know, it, it was rough, right? Get there, there. I get through it, get to the top, spectacular view. My, wind my way back down the backside, come back to that fork in the trail, and there's this young couple walking up. And they said, how's the trail? And I said, well, it's challenging. It's worth it, but it's challenging. And no matter what you do, go right. I explained why. And they said, gosh, we had no idea. Thanks so much. Next morning, back at the hotel, having breakfast. Emily comes over, pours some coffee. Hey, Emily, uh, I hiked Beehive yesterday. Oh, Emily, have you ever hiked Beehive? <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> Why did you tell me it was lovely? Oh, all the guests say it's lovely. Now, why do I tell you that story? So, it, it, is, it is symbolic for what is going on with this journey to profitable SaaS. Beehive is what management teams are going through. 
It's hard. It's making us very uncomfortable. All trails is what we're doing right here. We get the community together so we can learn together, makes it easier for us to navigate this. That young couple I met, that young couple, or the companies that I met with some of these over the past six months, the management team is heads down. They're not reading our research. They're not coming to these conferences. That's a self-inflicted wound. And who's Emily in this story? Who's Emily? Emily is that strategy consultant that your CEO hired <laughs> to work on your profitable strategy. And they show up with this great big PowerPoint, right? And by the way, in that deck, all the graphs go up and to the right. Oh, revenue's going up, and margins going up, and profits going up. And then we get, they get done with their presentation, and they say, oh, this journey to profitable SaaS, it's going to be lovely. It's not lovely. It's not lovely. And I can tell you after about 20 executive sessions, what I realized is the journey that leaders are on, it's the classic hero's journey. Do you know this Joseph Campbell framework? Right, so he studied all of these hero stories from cultures all over the world, and he said it's the same story again and again and again. And it starts where there's a hero who needs to go get something done, and they don't wanna go. They don't wanna go. And that was every company in this room <laughs> before 2022. Yeah, profitability on SaaS, JB and I called it the manana strategy, right? We'll get there, don't worry about it, we're focused on growth right now. But then there is this, this issue that forces the hero's hand. They have to go on the journey. And for companies in this room, that was when our valuations took a haircut in 2022, right? We had no choice. We had to start getting serious about profitable SaaS. Now, the hero starts the journey, and unfortunately, they, they face a lot of trials and tribulations. It's not pretty. It's not easy. And for folks in this room, you've been living through high interest rates, high inflation, a weird economy, softening pipelines. I mean, let's, it's been a rough two years. I think we can all acknowledge that. And in the hero's journey, it gets so bad, it's this point they call the abyss where it doesn't look like we're gonna make it out. And for many of you in this room, all the layoffs we've gone through, that has felt like the abyss. There are companies in this room that your entire history, you never laid off anybody until the past two years. And that rocks a culture. But the hero has a metamorphosis. They have a change of heart, a change of strategy, and they start to have success. And I am seeing this. There are management teams that are starting to really lean into what they need to do to have profitable SaaS business models. Now, let me share the first data point from all these sessions. So after each session, I would send a summary to the executive team on the questions we talked about, pointing them to research we have, and I gave them a rating. And I said, based on the questions you're asking in the dialogue, this is how I'm going to rate where you are with your maturity on your SaaS strategy. Are you just starting to form right? That's, that, that strategy? Are you now really, you've got some of the answers, but you're still storming and norming, or are you truly performing? Where are you? Here's how that data came out. Close to 60 companies. 60% 60 of those teams are in the forming stage. 30% storming, norming, only 10% are performing. I have to tell you, not one management team came back to me and said, I got that rating wrong, okay? So not one team pushed on the rating. And I'm sure you look at that and you're thinking, no way. I mean, we've had SaaS for over 20 years and people are just forming their strategy. Yes, on profitable SaaS, that's true. And let me give you the markers for performing. If I gave somebody a performing rating, this is what I'm looking for. Your gross margin is north of 70%. Industry average is 68%. You have 10% of your revenue coming from monetized CS and, and support. PS is profitable. Your, your, your cost of sales as a percentage of revenue is going down. Your profitability is going up. There are very few SaaS companies that meet this criteria. If you meet this criteria for your SaaS business, grab me at this conference. I want to hear your story. I want to tell your story. 
I'll flip it over. In the post-session survey, I asked them what expenses they were tracking. A majority of the companies don't know how much they're spending on free services. They just don't know. So, I mentioned we put that paper out there. It listed 12 plays you can run to improve profitability. And let me share from all these sessions some of the most common plays that I heard are absolutely being run, okay? The first one is monetizing PS. Charging for professional services around SaaS, very common. Monetizing premium technical support, having a premium support offer in play, very common. Monetizing some customer success. We know that over half the industry is doing it, and for the half that's not doing it, we have you know, fresh data that a majority of those companies are leaning in saying, we've got to do it. And then we have migrating renewals away from sales. So getting sales more focused on growth, hunting new business. Channel-led growth. I talked to so many companies, they're like, I got to get my partners more involved. I got to get my partners more involved in SaaS. I'm going to come back to that. And then optimizing service operations. So Jim Roth uh, from Salesforce did a great keynote here in our last conference in Orlando. Salesforce is gently bringing together their CS and SS organizations. <laughs> and there's a lot of people looking, right, to figure out can we get some of those synergies. So that's very common. So there's some themes here, right? We can make money on PS. We can't afford to give all these services away for free. Sales has got to focus on growth and we need to leverage partners more. So if you're having these thoughts, then you know, you're in good company. If you are not having any of these thoughts right here, at this point, you are way behind the power curve. So I want you to internalize that. Now here's plays which TSI knows will drive profitability, improve it, but I just don't see them being run a lot yet. Managed SaaS having a managed service capability to help the customer administrate your, your SaaS offer. I do see companies running it. The ones that are running it are happy with it, just not that common yet. Assigning expansion targets to customer success. How do we expand effectively the install base? Still a lot of you know, angst around how to do that and not a lot of clear practices uh, or common practices. Getting sales more productive. Not, you know, taking on higher account ratios, taking on bigger quotas, not seeing that. That's one of the things we talk about. JB already put this on the table in his opening keynote. I'm not seeing a lot of offer rationalization. And I'm definitely not seeing customer-led growth, which is you use data to prioritize your sales activities. I'll come back to that. And not a lot of product-led growth, using the product to drive revenue. So some of the same you know, the themes here again, right? We're still debating the role of customer success managers and sales in terms of expansion. We still have very stove-piped offers. And our data is a mess. <laughs> our data is a mess. It's going to be a big theme for the next couple of days. So let me share some of the most common questions executive teams ask about profitable SaaS that I wasn't surprised by, okay? Not surprised by this. What does a profitable SaaS business model look like? I, I know you think, really? No, th th there's still a lot of you know, debate and angst around this. Uh, we have tons of research on the economic engines that drive profitability. I don't think there should be so much debate, but you know, this is still a common question that executive teams are grappling with. The second one is, okay, we know we want partners to be involved, but what exactly do we want them to do and how do we enable them? So that's a very common question and a lot of immaturity there. We have published research on partner enablement frameworks for SaaS. We're still not that great on that in the industry. I'll come back to that. Third, how are customers effectively <laughs> leveraging data across silos? Big question. And as JB already mentioned this morning, our last book was all about this digital hesitation and this data is so critical because it unlocks multiple growth engines. Not just product-led growth, not just customer-led growth, outcome-led growth. These are all growth engines enabled by data, analytics, and more and more by, by AI. So those questions were you know, not a surprise. And then how do companies are organizing around AI? 
Um, th that's very common. This is, it was an article in the Wall Street Journal just a couple weeks ago. This is top of mind for a lot of executive teams. I know AI is important. I'm not sure how to organize around it. So all good questions. Not shocked that they're on the table. Here are questions that kind of surprised me, and they were very common. Number one, how do we improve the profitability of professional services? So we've had a practice at TSIA on this topic for you know, 17 plus years. We know exactly why an embedded professional service organization is unprofitable. The first book I wrote over 20 years ago was building professional services in a product company. There's not a lot of mystery here. So if your PS business is upside down and you're, you know you have to fix that, there shouldn't be a lot of mystery there. Second question that was a surprise is what customer success activities are other companies actually monetizing? Because, hey, we've never monetized it. We've told, heard from our salespeople, you can't monetize it. So like, oh my gosh, how's, what, what's the magic there? There's tons of examples in the industry at this point in time of what people can charge for. Lots of research there, take advantage of that. What are the right roles to have involved in a renewal? We've been renewing SaaS revenue streams for over 20 years, and we're still debating, you know, when should that be a CSM or renewal specialist? When should sales get back involved for renewal? When should they get calmed for that or not? There's still, you know, a, a lot of debate there. And again, we've got a lot of research on that. Um, I think the models are, we're making them harder on, on ourselves than they need to be. How do we improve our ability to expand existing customers? So you think about that layer model, land, adopt, expand, renew. You think the expand part, we would have mastered at this point, right? We want to get those are the, the highest margin revenues we can get is from that existing customer. And we're still struggling with that. So another data point here. I asked post-survey if you think about the big levers to improve profitability. Do you think to improve your SaaS business, is it going to be doing a better job of monetizing services? Is it migrating commercials away from sales to other you know, more cost-effective ways to take money off the table for renewals, expansion? Or are you going to fire up these data-driven growth engines? And what was fascinating, even though that is the most immature piece of what people are doing, and even though everyone's saying, man, my data's a mess, executive teams again and again and again gravitated to this lever. And they said, I think that's where I have the most potential. Why? Why do you think? And this is not my quote, but I love it. It's easier to change bits than change atoms. It's easier to get a new piece of software, a new piece of technology, and install that. That's easier than getting my salespeople to behave differently, to getting my CSMs to have new skills, right? It's easier than breaking down silos. I mean, I'll just put a new piece of technology in, okay? Now, we're gonna have some fun. Because I am going to spill some industry tea. Do you know what that spill the tea means? Yeah, my wife taught me that term. Um, I'm going to spill some tea. And if you did one of these sessions with me, and right now you're like, oh my god, I thought we were under NDA. We were. We were under NDA. I'm not going to name names. But I am going to say things out loud that people don't want to say out loud. Okay? Here's the first one. There's a lot of fish on the menu. Still, what do I mean by that? All you legacy technology companies who the last several years have changed your pricing models, right? And you're like, look at me, I've got recurring revenues, I'm an ARR company. And underneath the covers, you have a massive install base that is still disconnected on-prem. You still have some fish that you got to eat. And we're not talking about that. I was surprised how much of these install bases are still traditional on-prem. Second thing, there are management teams who do not know where they are going. So this question about what does a profitable SaaS business model look like and what Jessica just put on the table, if you're not aligned around the target results as an executive team, you're pretty much screwed coming out of the gate. And there are management teams that are very confused on what they think they're building and what they think they need to do to get profitable. The other thing is that leadership teams are confused about what story to tell investors. 
Because before it was easy. I'm a growth stock. I'm a growth stock. I'm a growth stock. Growth stocks sell hope, right? Don't worry. It's going to be awesome. In a couple of years, I'm going to dominate. I'm going to be the next unicorn. Value stocks sell discipline. I'm going to be profitable. I'm not going to miss my, my earnings. Leadership teams are confused. What story should I tell? There was one executive team I interviewed. I put them in that 10% category. They are absolutely performing. And you know the way they solved this? They said, this is our story to investors. Here's our growth target. Here's our margin improvement target. Here's our OI improvement target. We are going to basically tell both stories. We are growing, but we are going to do it profitably. But there's confusion there. Now, JB and I were just talking about this about two weeks ago, that this, this drug of growth. Everybody wants that drug again, right? Everybody wants to get back on the growth train. And I, that is true. Every executive team I talk to, they're just, I can't wait to get back to growth. But they want to do it with less salespeople. They want to do it with less salespeople. Why? We took all this headcount out. A lot of that headcount was in sales. We now want to get growing again. And they're looking at their business models. And they're saying, I can't simply go hire all that sales headcount back. And one of the survey questions that I did was, do you think your total headcount is going to grow in the next four quarters? About 60% of executives said no. And that aligns with other surveys I've seen. So we're, you know, we're tech. We're growth. But we're not going to do that with headcount. Let's talk about the low margin service activities you have in your SaaS business models that are dragging them down. What are we going to do about that? What are we going to do? Well, we could do a better job of improving our delivery efficiencies. That would help, right? We could do a better job of telling the value story to the customer so we can take money off the table and charge. Is that what we're going to do? No, 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 no. You know what we're going to do with those shitty services? We're going to push them to our partners. <laughs> Back to why everybody wants your partners more involved. I get this crap out of my business model, and my, that makes me more profitable, right? Here's the other piece of that story, spilling a little bit of tea. I interviewed managed service providers, some of the largest resellers on the planet. They are frustrated with you as technology partners when it comes to as a service. How are they going to make money around your SaaS? Are they going to be involved in the renewals down the road? Are you going to pay me for that? You know, I was talking to one of them. They said, I'm getting all these incentives from this one technology company to move customers to as a service, but they're not telling me if when those renewals come up, those incentives are going to be there. And if they're not there, I can't make money at this. So I'm telling you right now, technology providers, partners, you need some serious therapy. You need to get in the room on a couch talking to each other because you're talking past each other right now. The other thing I'll tell you is that AI is an art project for most companies. It is an art project, and it can't be. And we'll talk about that. But uh, you know, when I test on how are you funding it, how are you prioritizing your AI opportunities, how are you getting lessons learned across you know, pilots, a lot of crickets there. And finally, I'm going to tell you, in reality, in this industry right now, there are only two types of management teams. There are management teams that want to go on this hero's journey. They're leaning into it. They don't have all the answers right now. That's fine. But they're like, we, we know that you know, what got us here is not going to be the right strategy moving forward. And they're chipping on this conversation. And then there are management teams that when I would get in these conversations, what they really wanted to do is spend 90 minutes telling me all the reasons they can't go on this journey right now. Our systems won't support it. You know, our employees aren't ready. Our customers aren't asking for it. Our investors won't tolerate, you know, all these reasons. And I am going to challenge every person sitting here. Before you leave Vegas, you need to figure out what type of management team you're on or working for. Because it's going to be career limiting for you if you're on the wrong one. Now, I want to end with some move forward here. Things I want you to be thinking about, things we're going to be working on, because in many ways, the journey on profitable SaaS is not over. The first thing is, we wrote a paper 
back in 2021 called The Have and Have Nots of the Technology Industry. I encourage you to read that. I encourage you to share that up and down the management stack because that paper outlines the attributes that winning technology companies are going to have. And that paper was spot on in 2021. It's 100% irrelevant today. The second thing I will say, and we're going to be talking about this in the next two days, data is absolutely the new oil. This thing about busting silos is so important because data is going to feed this AI set of AI capabilities. We just put out paper out a couple weeks ago, the TSI AI capabilities landscape. And the framework we're using here is not ours. It comes from the industry. We talk about AI capabilities being below the waterline. What does that mean? They're, they're becoming pretty common. At the waterline, companies are piloting. And if it's well above the waterline, that's the hype. Okay, And we are committed to cut through the hype and give you visibility on what's really going on with AI capabilities. And we're going to track it across these different areas. So what AI capabilities are actually being deployed in customer success for revenue management, et cetera. So this is a, a killer paper. Uh, take advantage of that. I've already had several conversations with members about that. We're going to start that as a catalyst to kick off our next research journey which is going to be on how companies are deploying AI internally. That's what we're focused on. It's not, again, the stories you want to spin. Everybody in this room I know is an AI company now. I get that. I go to your websites. I'm not worried about that. I'm worried, and the research team is worried, about how you are deploying it internally. And I'm, I just started this process with the help of the researchers. They're nominating uh, companies for me to talk to about specific use cases. I've done three of these. One of them was with open text on an education services uh, use case. It's stunning. It is stunning. The cost savings, the time savings, the incremental values being unlocked in a bunch of different use cases. And my fear, and the fear of the TSIA team, is that if you're flat-footed on this, if you're kind of just, oh, we'll wait and see how it goes, you're going to wake up, and your cost structure is going to be way out of whack. So you got to jump on this one. So I know <laughs> that this is not a fun time right now in tech. I wish it was a super fun time. I wish people were just throwing money at us and you know, we were just all back to the good old days of 10 years ago. But that's not what we're facing right now. And I'm, I'm feeling and seeing the stress in these executive teams. What's going on to make SaaS profitable, and now to incorporate a whole wave of AI capabilities, we're going to have to stretch. <laughs> we are going to have to get out of our comfort zone. But I'm telling you, for the companies that make it to the top of this, the view is going to be spectacular. Thank you.